Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Who Started the Cold War, a professional development webinar sponsored by America in class from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Before we get underway, let me introduce the National Humanities Center to you. Many of our veterans uh, know about the Center, but we may have some newcomers tonight. Uh, the Center is located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. It is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. That simply means that we run a fellowship program that brings scholars from this country and abroad to the Center to research and write on topics and disciplines like history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. The Center is distinctive among institutes for advanced study in that it maintains a vigorous program of outreach to teachers, high school teachers primarily of English and uh, American history and American literature. You've already discovered our webinars. You can find all of the other resources we offer to teachers by going to americainclass.org. That will take you to this page. And from here, you can gain access to all of the materials and resources that we offer for teachers. Please visit our Pinterest page. There you will find that we aggregate material from our own resources and from other sources and provide you with very interesting material that you can use in your units. Also, stay abreast of what's going on at the center by hooking up with us on Facebook. <clears throat> in addition, you will soon be receiving the second edition of our new newsletter. Uh, watch for it. That's a good way to stay abreast of new developments at the center. We uh, announce our upcoming webinars and we feature some lessons and then we provide you with what we hope you'll find as interesting material uh, that uh, refers to life at the National Humanities Center in general. Now, when our seminar is over this evening tonight, please go back to the Who Started the Cold War website. There you will find a recording of the program along with the PowerPoint. Feel free to use the PowerPoint in your classes. That's what it's there for. You will also find an evaluation form, which we hope you'll fill out. And once, you have, once you've done that, send that back to us, and you'll be able then to download documentation of participation uh, that you'll be able to present to your local certifying authority for whatever recertification credit uh, your participation in this program warrants. Now, I want to tell you <clears throat> about two new lessons that the National Humanities Center has produced. Both are relevant to this program this evening. NSC 68, America's Cold War Blueprint, uh, explores the report that the National Security Council presented to President Truman in 1950, which laid out the strategy that dictated American foreign policy for pretty much the second half of the 20th century. And now our newest lesson is on the Marshall Plan speech, Rhetoric and Diplomacy. It's useful for both English and history classes. In English class, students will be able to explore uh, the five-part structure of persuasive oratory, and in history class, students will be able to explore the challenges that Secretary of State Marshall and President Truman faced as they launched the massive aid package for war-ravaged Europe. Now, I've already told you how you can get your documentation of participation for this evening, so let's move ahead to tell you how you can participate. Our seminar leader is going to be lecturing tonight. We're going to stop from time to time to pose discussion questions, and we hope you'll respond to them by putting your cursor in that box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, typing your message, hitting that send button. It will appear in the large chat box above, and I will bring your comments into the conversation at appropriate moments. But don't wait for us to ask questions, please. If you have questions or you'd like to make comments, bring those into the discussion. Send them to us. I'll work them into the seminar. Uh, at, at, uh, at an appropriate time. And remember, the more you participate, the better the webinar. Now, before we get underway, before I introduce our speaker, let me give you a warning. The next slide you see is going to contain a kind of jittery American flag. That is not an editorial statement. We are not trying to signal the answer to the question. That is a technological bug that we were unable to get out of this presentation. So please try to ignore it. So let's begin then. We're very pleased to have with us tonight Philip Brenner, Professor of International Relations at American University. Phil's area of interest is U.S. policy toward Latin America, history of U.S. foreign relations, and, po and the policy-making process. You see his publications there. I'm not going to read them all. You see an emphasis on Cuba, and Phil was very, uh, was lately, uh, received a good deal of media attention, lots of phone calls, in connection with President Obama's recent trip to uh, Havana. So now, let me turn the program over to Phil. And Phil, I have a simple question for you. Who started the Cold War? <laughs> well, let, why don't we ask the uh, group, this is a large group, 
uh, thank you for all, all of you for participating. I hope we'll have an interesting evening. I hope to leave you with more questions than answers, but at least a way of uh, thinking about the questions uh, as you try to answer them. So uh, any guesses about, or what's the general sense about who started the Cold War and what were the events that started the Cold War? What's the general sense here? Okay, who started? Who do you think started it? And what were the precipitating events? Uh, I grew up during the Cold War. Uh, let's see, shared responsibility. Okay, Judith Batten, both sides. What, what's, what were some of the events? The Berlin Airlift, the USA, uh, via the NSC document, NSC 68, I should think. Was it, um, well, the Cold War was going on when Berlin, when Berlin became a hotspot. Issues over free elections in Poland. I think it was the East Europe elections right after the war. So we're dating it from, say, between 1945 and 49. Let's see what other... Uh, comments do we have here about who started the Cold War? We have a few more coming in. This is a good selection. Let's see what Shana is uh, going to give us. Okay, we'll wait for her response. Um, let's see. Uh, Truman. Truman is also typing. A good name for this webinar tonight, Mr. Truman. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Economic crisis, such as those in Turkey and Greece. We had a civil war going on in Greece as well. Okay, Phil, well, while we're waiting for some others, what do you make of these responses? Well, I think that they, all of these responses uh, capture a portion of uh, what was going on, and uh, they identify some of the factors. Soviet control of Eastern Europe, uh, as Judith uh, indicates. Um, what I would like uh, the group to come away with tonight is some new materials that uh, we've uh, provided, some suggested readings, um, and to show them how a multi-factor analysis that takes a look at some of the things they've pointed out, as well as things like personalities, domestic uh, uh, factors like the U.S. economy, uh, help us understand what may have caused and ultimately how an empathetic approach helps us think about what might have prevented it and how we might use the lessons we get from studying the Cold War to prevent future conflicts. Um, so let's move on and see how we, we're going to do that. Uh, I'd like uh, the group to come back to some of these framing questions uh, at the end. They can uh, keep them in mind. Uh, let's begin with some basic definitions uh, as to what the Cold War was. You know, let me help people appreciate, and maybe they do, uh, that this is a controversial subject, that there are many sides to this subject, uh, and very great scholars uh, have are still in disagreement about what the Cold War means, what it was, uh, who started it, uh, how we should think about the Cold War. So I'm going to try to give you some variations on that today. Let's take four definitions of the Cold War. Uh, it was a conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. That'd be a, a simple way of describing it. Uh, it turns out that the United States and Soviet Union actually never fought directly against each other. But they did come close uh, in 1948 in Berlin, 1961 in Berlin, they faced each other. Uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States uh, placed its strategic forces at the highest state of alert, short of nuclear war, defense condition two, and we almost came into conflict through accident. Uh, and certainly during the uh, so-called Yom Kippur War in 1973 in the Middle East, uh, when we put our defense forces at the DEFCON 3 to warn the Soviets not to intrude into that area. So there were times where we did uh, come close to actual conflict. Both sides had nuclear weapons pointed at each other, but we never actually had a conflict. So a second possibility is that it was a competition, a lower grade of hostility between two empires, uh, each trying to control Europe and the third world. Uh, and this seems to make some sense because uh, both countries were actively engaged in Europe. Both countries uh, tried to have allies in the third world. 
and both after the death of Stalin, uh, look to the third world as the area of competition in proxy wars. A proxy war is a war fought by two other, you can think of a proxy war like lawyers in a trial, uh, each lawyer representing uh, a one of the parties to a, a conflict, and the winner of the conflict between the two lawyers essentially is the winner of the two sides conflict. So we think of proxies all the time that way, but uh, we used and they used other countries as the proxies uh, to uh, challenge each other. Uh, and the, that was true in Vietnam, it was true in Afghanistan. Uh, and that might be a way of describing what it was, but it's not complete. That, that I would say that that's a useful way of, in thinking about the Cold War because it takes into account the global nature. A third possibility is if you can think of the metaphor of shadow boxing. So uh, each country effectively was looking in the mirror and fighting and used the image of an enemy to uh, provide the necessary buildup of its military for domestic political purposes. Each had its own reasons for building up the military domestically. Uh, but in some ways, the, they weren't fighting each other. They were fighting themselves um, with, without any real enemy. Uh, and a fourth definition, which is uh, maybe a fudge, uh, in a sense, but does encompass what was going on in this period, is that it was a period of tension. There's no question there was tension uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. They both built up their military capabilities, including nuclear weapons. And there were several conflicts that occurred in the third world in the name of these countries, uh, with the two superpowers backing opposing sides. And in fact, you could think of this as the first Cold War. There was some Scholars talk about a second Cold War, that uh, there was a period of detente in the 1970s and a second Cold War begin in 1981. So uh, I offer you these as definitions with none of them being fully accurate, but uh, it's to help you appreciate the complexity of this subject. So if we're gonna ask who started the Cold War, we ought to have a sense of when it started. So you know, a chronology is not an unbiased uh, process, creating an, a chronology. When you start something, very often will determine how you think about the outcome. So as the most of the people in the uh, group suggested, the Cold War occurred or started after World War II. That is the conventional view, but Another way of thinking about the Cold War is to start it in 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution. So the Bolshevik Revolution frightened Western powers. Partly they were frightened by Lenin's promise to make world revolution. In the United States, there was some of this fear, but there was also a sense that uh, there were uh, domestic unions that were radical, that had a communist orientation, uh, and that if we went after communists, the Bolsheviks, the foreign enemy, we would also effectively be able to put down these radical unions. And this is actually what led to the Red Scare of 1919-20 and the Palmer Raids against alleged communists. This is when J. Edgar Hoover joined the FBI and made anti-communism his calling. Uh, another reason to start it around this period is that the, from the Soviet perspective, the United States uh, actually maintained troops on Soviet territory after World War I to support the white Russians who were fighting in the civil war that was going on there. I, I mean, this is something very few Americans are aware of. In fact, I would say even today, Russians don't know much about this. Our nominal goal was to prevent the Bolsheviks from getting uh, equipment we might have left behind in two places of Vladivostok and Murmansk, but um, our real purpose was in keeping 10,000 troops on Russian, now Soviet soil, it was to support the white Russians. When that seemed to be failing, uh, we pulled them out, but we did not recognize the Soviet Union until 1933. 
you can imagine that that caused some anger and distrust on their part. In World War Phil, Phil, if I may, uh, Phil, if I may interrupt here, <clears throat> we have a question. Um, uh, Mary, Mary Ann McElroy writes, didn't the British have troops there as well? And does that mean that Lenin saw us as allies as well against them? So did the, were the British uh, also in uh, Russia? Yes, they were. Uh, it, the, it, the U.S. forces were the American Expeditionary Force, uh, but the British also had troops. They had fewer troops, um, but they had troops as well. Uh, nominally the same reason, to mm -hmm. protect the weapons they had left behind. That mm -hmm. was good. Uh, okay. During World War II, the United States and Soviet Union were nominally allies after Nazi Germany invaded uh, the Soviet Union uh, in 1941. But Churchill remained suspicious of Stalin. And in fact, the Soviets were very angry that they were bearing the brunt of uh, dying during the war. They, in order to stop Germany, they burned down a third of their territory, uh, the Western Third, uh, to stop the forward movement of Soviet troops. The Allies didn't actually help them in any sense until the, the June 6th uh, landing uh, at Normandy. Uh, and, uh, and that left a, a bitter taste in their mouth. And there was the Yalta Agreement where uh, Franklin and Roosevelt essentially tried to placate uh, Stalin uh, and agreed that there could be a, a Soviet essentially takeover of Eastern Europe. He understood that the Soviets were concerned about creating buffer states um, so that there wouldn't be another invasion. They had suffered an invasion from Napoleon uh, and twice from Germany. Uh, and so the, uh, Roosevelt was appreciative of that. Um, but there was, as we'll talk about in just a bit, there was a, a also a, a response uh, afterward by uh, uh, Truman, uh, who uh, went to Potsdam a few months later. This was after the European war was over, but before we had defeated uh, Japan. And he, and he goes to Potsdam with the knowledge that we're about to explode an atomic bomb. He arrives there, gets the word that we are, we have just had a successful test, and he is very arrogant towards uh, Stalin, dismisses him as a, a two-bit dictator. We, excuse me, folks, we, we seem to have lost our sound for a moment here. Let me see if I can get it back. Um, there. Phil, can you hear us? Hello, I can hear you. Okay, if we, we momentarily lost your sound, I'm sorry. <clears throat> but while I have, uh, while, I, while we're uh, taking a pause here, we have a question. <clears throat> Judith Batten would like us to elaborate oh, yes. on that wonderful poster <laughs> you gave us <laughs> so from the from the 1930s. Uh, and as you can see, it's an ad by Scott Tissue uh, telling you to tell, telling employers to buy Scott Tissue so that their the uh, bottoms of their employees will be soft enough and they won't be alienated at work. Um, wonderful ad. Uh, but it's, it's indicative of how we had already begun a kind of anti-communist uh, propaganda in the United States. This is from the mid 1930s. So while, um, while, we're, while we're taking, well, while, while we're digressing here for a moment, could I ask a question about exactly what FDR um, seeded at, at Yalta? Did he have any idea of the sort of rule that the Soviets would impose on Eastern Europe, or was he talk, thinking more about a, a sphere of influence kind of arrangement? It was more of a sphere of influence. Um, and the idea, he thought he had worked out with Stalin that there could be elections, mm -hmm. um, particularly in Poland. That was of great concern. Uh, I don't think he imagined that other 
countries besides Poland would be involved. Maybe, maybe Hungary, but uh, Poland was the great concern, and it was the, actually the greatest concern, along with Germany, for uh, the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, so they they had worked out an arrangement where all of the Allies would take control of Germany, and what had to happen then, in a bitter way, that Germany got divided so that the Soviets controlled Eastern Germany and the Allies controlled, had uh, occupational uh, regions in Western Germany. Right. So, and, and the ending of the war, the dropping of the atomic bomb, also controversial uh, story, the best evidence we have now is that it was actually unnecessary uh, to even drop any of the atomic bombs, but the, it's the dropping of the second atomic bomb that really is most disturbing uh, because we killed many, many people there and people suffered afterwards from the radiation. It came only three days after the first. And the argument is we were trying to prevent, uh, we were trying to save lives uh, by ending the war quickly. But the plan to invade uh, Japan uh, was to invade in November, and this happens in August. So there was time to wait four days, five days for the Japanese response to the first bombing. Uh, and we, it seems as if the reason we dropped that second bomb wholly was to try to force the Japanese to end the, the war as quickly as possible so that, because we the Soviets declared war against the Japanese on uh, August 8th, the day before we dropped the atomic bomb on Nagasaki. So the Soviets understood this. They, it looked like we were even cavalier about dropping as many bombs as we might want. In fact, we had no more bombs, but we wanted to leave the impression that we could drop more and more bombs, and it was enough to, to intimidate them. Uh, the, the conventional view that was expressed is that the, uh, and there is certainly an element of truth to this, that the Soviets came to dominate uh, all of the countries in Eastern Europe, Poland, East Germany, and so on. Uh, in reaction, the United States pursued a containment policy. The Soviets exploded an atomic bomb, communists win in China. So they, the tension grew very quickly, but it was stimulated the, the view has by the Soviet actions in uh, Eastern Europe. So I, I offer you these three time points to say, if you start with 1917, you might think about this a little differently. It might help you see however hard it is to think about the Soviet perspective and Stalin. It might enable you to see this slightly differently. So, so if I could interrupt here for a moment, we have a question. Shana writes, other than Churchill, were other allied leaders suspicious of Stalin prior to the division of Germany and the Yalta Agreement? Was anyone else suspicious of Stalin? Well, within the conservative party in uh, Great Britain, there were a lot of people suspicious. In the United States, there were military people who were suspicious of uh, Stalin. But in terms of other allies, they didn't matter um, because we didn't really have any other allies uh, that were of importance. By that point, the French had been taken over. Uh, there was, I mean, Charles de Gaulle and the Free French, but they were not an ally that we consulted, really. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't consult with the Chinese. We didn't consult with the Australians. We, this was, uh, became a war that Great Britain and the United States were fighting. Mm -hmm. And one of our participants now refers to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Could you quickly remind us of what that was all about? So in, in uh, 1939, uh, the Soviet foreign minister and the German foreign minister signed a non-aggression pact. Uh, and uh, the this led a horrified a lot of communists around the world that uh, the Soviets would sign with Hitler, uh, such a pact. Uh, they were hoping that the Soviets would fight against Hitler. But from the Soviet perspective, this was very much like the Munich Agreement, mm -hmm. uh, the, the sense that 
uh, they needed time to build up uh, while uh, if they essentially uh, allowed Hitler to uh, move forward immediately against the Soviet Union, that they would lose. So they needed time to start building themselves up. And they used those two years between the pact and the time the Soviets, uh, Germany invaded the Soviet Union to, uh, in fact, increase their military strength. And we have another question here. <clears throat> did the Soviets develop their atomic weapons on their own, or did spies supply the Soviet Union with the necessary information? I know that's another seminar in and of itself, but what's your quick response to that, Phil? So I, I was going to uh, mention that later, but let you okay. can bring it up now. Uh, that's fine. Um, so the Soviets exploded their atomic bomb in 1949. Uh, the CIA had estimated that they weren't likely to be able to do this until 1952, and so at, at the earliest. And so the, the conventional wisdom was the only way they could have done this so quickly was by having uh, stolen the secrets from the United States. In fact, they did steal some secrets from the United States, but all that they got ultimately were plans that confirmed what they already knew. Uh, they were already working in this direction. And it turns out that they had stolen German scientists. Germany was working on an atomic bomb uh, during the war. Uh, that was one of the reasons we started working on an atomic bomb. And uh, the, their German scientists were able to help them uh, further along than they might have been otherwise. We didn't take that into account. And it was not the what the spies stole that gave them the advantage. It was their German scientists. Okay, they're Nazis so, versus our Nazis. I'm sorry? They're Nazis versus ours after the war. In a sense, which was also the case in missile technology. Yeah. Remember we had von Braun. Uh, so let me ask this question. You can imagine how from 1917 to 1949, in that 32 year period, the two countries came to distrust each other. But is it a satisfactory explanation that the tension that where both countries believed in a sense they were in a life and death struggle, does distrust provide the kind of satisfactory explanation we might want to explain that perception that both countries had? Is there any sense about that? It's a good question. I was thinking about that. I was going through the slides preparing for the webinar tonight. Let's see. Shane is typing in. Um, certainly distrust can, can make you wary of the other side, but I'm not entirely sure it can prompt you to do the things we did. I mean, we, we paid an awfully steep price for our distrust. I mean, just think of, uh, think of the proxy war in Southeast Asia. Let's see what our participants are saying here. Shauna and Judith Batten are typing in. Somebody had mentioned distrust earlier as one of the causes of the Cold War. Um, and the other thing that made me wonder about distrust, too, we're going to talk about this later on, was, <clears throat> you know, our competition over uh, former colonies. You know, would our distrust be enough um, to, uh, to make us uh, pursue those colonies? Okay, Judith writes, they had lived with that distrust for a number of years, so why the change? Uh, <clears throat> um, let's see. Not entirely. I think there's a typo in, in, <laughs> okay, I know when you're typing these things, it's very easy to get typos in when you're, when you're hurrying. So we'll see what Shauna is going to uh, say when she uh, fixes up the typo. We have a couple of more people typing in. Is distrust enough to explain the Cold War? That's the fundamental question we're posing here with this slide. Let's see what our participants have to say. Got one or two more in here, and then we'll go back to you, Phil. Let's see. Okay, we got multiple attendees. Well, while we're waiting, Phil, what, what's what's your view? Oh, here we go, Shauna. I think fear was actually the basis of the distrust, but as I said earlier, not a reason for the actions taken. <clears throat> Other folks typing in. So what's what's the scholarly <clears throat> um, consensus on this? Was the distrust enough? to uh, propel us to do what we did during the Cold War and the Soviet Union as well? Well, uh, let's just, I, I don't think it was just that there was atmosphere of distrust, but competing ideologies. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the scholarly consensus is, as we'll take a look at in just a minute, um, there's an ideology there uh, compounded with shaky global economic situation after the war. So now you're talking about several other factors that would reinforce distrust. And that's basically where we're going to go. We take, we're going to look at five causes. Some scholars emphasize one of the five. Some scholars emphasize two or three of the five. Uh, we're going to take a look at all five and see where they take us. Um, if uh, some may be more important than others, uh, it's room for further investigation. So let, let's take a look at that. Churchill, didn't Churchill want the Russians to bear the brunt of the battle against the Nazis? If so, wouldn't that reinforce? Yes, that's what I was suggesting. Um, the uh, that. That's exactly the way the Soviets felt. Okay, so the first cause, people, the personalities of different people. Harry Truman uh, was became president of the United States with very little knowledge about foreign policy. The only way in which he had been involved in foreign policy was as the chairman of a temporary committee in the Senate. Uh, he'd been a senator from Missouri who uh, he was investigating war profiteering during World War II, particularly at the beginning of World War II, but he'd never gotten into foreign policy questions. Uh, and Roosevelt uh, kept him in the dark. Uh, he knew very little about what was going on. Roosevelt, in fact, had intended to uh, in, begin to teach Truman about foreign policy after uh, 1945. Roosevelt actually knew he was very ill and imagined he might even retire uh, at the end of uh, his this the second year of his fourth term, and he felt Truman should begin to learn about foreign policy uh, during that second year. Uh, but Roosevelt died only a month after he was inaugurated. Uh, Truman, uh, because he had very little knowledge, uh, he relied on James Burns. Uh, for a, a lot of information, uh, and later on uh, Dean Acheson. And they reinforced a, a gut anti-communism that he had. Remember, Truman was the, the last president we've had who didn't go to college. Uh, so he knew very little about the world. Uh, and those two were uh, very strong, hawkish individuals who also believed that the United States had a special role in the world to provide for uh, leadership. And so they both had global ambitions and a, a fierce hatred of, of the Soviet Union and communism. On the Soviet side, we had a paranoid leader in Joseph Stalin, who as he get, got older, got more and more paranoid. He had purges of virtually most of the people around him, fearing everyone was out to get him. Uh, Molotov succeeded by being uh, by feeding Stalin, uh, feeding his paranoia about other people and about other countries. Uh, though a very bright man, he was also uh, a very strong believer in uh, a doctrine that said that the United States and the Soviet Union were bound to conflict and that the Soviet Union had to be prepared for that conflict. So in a sense, personalities were important, but of course, both Truman and Stalin headed very large countries with large bureaucracies. And so it took more than just their sheer personality to make this happen. So a second, as someone suggested, was competing ideologies. But to discuss that, we need to define what those ideologies were. Often we think of American ideology as democracy, maybe capitalism. I want to offer you the notion that the ideology that emerged, one of the two that emerged after World War II in the United States was the ideology of national security. There's a scholar at the University of Virginia, Melvin Leffler, is one of the leading scholars of the Cold War, who argues that this is what this policy was quite important. And he defines national security in a way that you might find interesting. You can see that he says it's not just the protection, the safeguarding of our 
physical base or territorial integrity, which is usually how we thought about national security. It also means defending the state's organizing ideology, such as liberal capitalism, protecting political institutions. Uh, and so this is more expensive. How do you think this compares to a traditional notion of defense? What does this oh. tell you? Okay, we have a question on the table. How does this idea of national security compare with traditional notions of defense? Any takers on that question? And you know, it seems... Well, what is the traditional notion of defense? Okay, prior question. What's the traditional notion of defense? <clears throat> so we've got some folks typing in. Let's see what our participants have to say. Traditional notion of defense and how does national security <clears throat> differ, if at all, from that? Certainly, is, as, as you mentioned, uh, Phil, the traditional notion of defense was had to do with defending the homeland, the territory, and this really expands that. It, it becomes far more uh, ideological, and I think it has implications for uh, internal dissent. I mean, you could, you could say that somebody criticizing our core values is a threat to our national security, which, of course, people did during... Cold War. Okay, defend the borders of one's country, protecting its integrity as a nation state. Traditional notion, Merrill rights. See what other ones are coming in. If yes. You think about the fact that we now have a Department of Homeland Security uh, that you would have might have thought the Department of Defense would have been that institution uh, involved in defending the homeland. But in fact, the Department of Defense is more involved in defending overseas interests whereas, which are part of U.S. national security, and the Department of Homeland Security now defends our borders. President Obama made this very clear that when we went to war in Libya. Uh, he said that there are times when we, our physical security is not threatened, but that our core values are threatened. And in those cases, we have to rise to the challenge to defend those core values. Uh, he was talking about, uh, in this case, what looked like it might be genocide, although it actually wasn't. But uh, that expansive view was articulated fairly recently by our current president. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so this is an ideological statement. This isn't simply a statement of fact. It has the, the element of ideology. There was a second that was related, and that was uh, Pax Americana. The United States emerged from World War uh, II as the, clearly the strongest country. To give you a sense of this economically, uh, in order to buy things internationally, a country needs what's called hard currency, a currency that is internationally convertible. That, uh, And you probably would experience something like this if you try to cash a check from a local bank in from Pennsylvania and you're in Nevada and they've never heard of that local bank. Well, nowadays we can check on the internet and they can verify it, but it's, it's not easy. If you don't, you're not aware, you're not sure how much a currency is worth. Before World War II, the international currency that everyone used was the British pound sterling. After World War II, the currency was the US dollar. The British pound sterling did not become a hard currency until 1957. Today, there are four hard currencies that are international use for trade. The dollar, the British pound, the euro, and the Japanese yen. Uh, so other countries have to be able to get those currencies. We had the only currency. We printed our hard currency. We, were, we had the strongest military. Our industries hadn't been hurt at all. Uh, in fact, our industries grew uh, whereas the Soviet Union had destroyed itself in some ways, and the Germans had helped, Britain, France, all of Europe lay in, in ruins. We were the strongest economically, and politically, we represented democracy. Uh, and so there was this sense that we had arrived at the moment where we could bring a global peace through American power. Uh, and that piece would be based on the view of the United States as being an exceptional nation. American exceptionalism, you probably teach some of this, um, is the idea that the United States 
it was unique in the history of the world. It it represented the father's development of human civilization. We the uh, the continent was a free continent without class boundaries. Well, of course, that there were Native Americans and there were slaves, but we have to ignore those right, those problems. Uh, the the theory was that we were exceptional because everyone could make it on their own. Everyone was free, and uh, uh, and what's important about that is that uh, we were granted this possibility by divinity, who said that we can't just accept this, but we have to. Uh, we have a moral responsibility now to carry this to other people throughout the world. So with a kind of mission. So if you relate that to our sense, as Richard was suggesting, of national security, our core beliefs being rooted in American exceptionalism now, and we believe that we have a mission to bring peace to the world by expanding, you can see how this that this discussion question almost becomes answered by itself. Is there any thoughts about this? Well, Phil, while our participants are writing in <clears throat> about this discussion question, we have two really good comments about the last one, about the difference between national security and defense. Shana writes, national security seems very different and more difficult to defend than the traditional notions of defense because it includes ideas, values, which cannot be seen, which cannot be seen but understood. And then Rashida writes, it's the jump from defending the physical space to a more philosophical space. I think this is how the notion of national defense has moved from a physical threat of nuclear warfare to the ideological threat of terrorism that can invade a nation's psyche. That is how a nation thinks and defends its way of existence, to, I think, uh, very insightful comments. And uh, <clears throat> on this question, and the one that's currently before us, how might this belief lead to conflict? Teresa writes, it leads to conflict because it is an invasion into another country. Um, what the U.S. values may not be culturally relevant to the other country. There's that issue of the question of the moral responsibility to carry our, our ideology abroad. Some of this involves racism because we think if another country doesn't share these values, they are less good than we are. We are the <clears throat> farthest development of human civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, these were the this was the ideological uh, framework for the United States. The Soviet Union had its own ideological framework, uh, and that was Marxist-Leninism. So Marxist traditional uh, uh, Marxism focuses on the way in which the owners of capital com, uh, compete, fight against uh, the uh, labor. They try to extract the greatest value from labor. Uh, and th that class conflict is the fundamental conflict that moves history. Lenin added to that notion by believing that capitalists need to uh, seize control of the state in order to enable capitalism to be reproduced domestically. And in the process of seizing control of the state, they then take on a role for global capitalism as it seeks to expand uh, and control all of the markets of a global corporation. Uh, and that he called imperialism. Uh, that kind of imperialism by capitalist countries inevitably would come into conflict with countries that don't share those values want to resist capital, don't want to be exploited, and that would put the Soviet Union in a defensive position against the monopoly capitalists who wanted to uh, pursue imperialism. Uh, we have another comment here. Um, Shana writes, American exceptionalism seems like a modern form of imperialism. Isn't this the thought process used by many missionaries during the age of imperialism to help those in another country to become more civilized, starting with their belief system? So this, this idea of American exceptionalism goes way back, doesn't it? Yes, and it, well, it, and it, it's part of what the British thought of as well. I mean, so the white man's burden is partly that. I, I, a book I'd recommend on this that Shana uh, harkens to is Things Fall Apart by Kinoa Achibe, uh, where it's about how missionaries become the forerunners. In, uh, it's a wonderful book for high school students. But if you have to teach it properly, um, things fall apart. Yes, um, it's about how missionaries 
lead people who have a collectivist culture to taking on an individualist culture so that uh, when the corporations come in, the companies, the imperial companies, uh, they can pull people away uh, to, in fact, get them to leave their uh, their communities and work for the companies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it taught from that perspective, students might find it very compelling. Uh, so let's. So we now have two explanatory factors. One is personalities. The second is competing ideologies. Let's take a look at a third. So this comes closest to the traditional point of view, and that is it was Soviet policies and actions that caused the Cold War. Uh, Winston Churchill talked about an iron curtain having descended across the continent. There you see the white line there, the picture of the iron curtain. Uh, although Yugoslavia is on the left-hand side of that because it was not beholden to the Soviet Union. In some ways, it had, even though it was communist, it had broken away from the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, he warned that the Soviets were uh, going to try to take over the rest of Europe, not necessarily by uh, invading. Uh, they would use fifth columns. The notion of a fifth column is that uh, these are people who work from within. They uh, seem to be people of, uh, they could be Frenchmen and uh, they could be Swiss or uh, Dutch, but they in fact are intent on serving the communist purpose. Um, and when socialist parties started becoming elected, 1946, the socialists won in France. They had won in 1945 in uh, Great Britain. Uh, they were a dominant party in West Germany. Uh, the, this frightened very much uh, the United States and frightened uh, Britain into thinking that the socialists, well, socialist communists, we didn't have a sense of there being a difference. Uh, uh, that this was the way the Soviets would take over those countries. And then the Soviets, of course, uh, before the atomic bomb, the, the China, the Chinese Civil War led to defeat by the uh, defeat of the nationalists who we were supporting by the Chinese communists led by Mao. And that, we believe, was further evidence of Soviet expansionism 1949, the Soviets dropped the atomic bomb, uh, which we believed was caused by spies, as we talked about before. Now, we did some things on the other hand. So let me point to three things from a Soviet perspective that would have led them to think that the United States was be acting aggressively. The first was the idea of containment. So some of you may have taught this to students, let me give you a way that, of teaching this that students might be able to understand best. Because containment, the, the word is used very commonly today. We talk about containing ISIS. We talk about containing Al-Qaeda or Iran. It, the meaning of containment has become debased. There was a particular meaning that George Kennan wrote this famous long telegram that then got published as a Mr. X article in Foreign Affairs there was this notion he had that was based on a theory. And it's the theory that uh, chemistry teachers often uh, try to uh, teach students. They'll come into a room and there's a beaker of bubbling uh, liquid on the counter and the teacher walks in and puts a cork in the a flask and the students in the front row jump back because they think it's going to explode. And in fact, the bubbles calm down and the, you, you, this stops the, the uh, rising up of uh, the liquid. And the chemistry teacher explains that some molecules under the pressure of ordinary air are unstable. Uh, and then when you increase the pressure by putting the cork in, that they in fact cohere better and they become stable. Um, and that's what Kennan thought containment should be about. He thought the Soviet Union was basically an unstable country. It was a system that didn't work. And so they naturally tried to expand as a way of, of, of uh, diverting the attention of their uh, citizens. And so what would happen is uh, if you 
essentially put the cork in, you contain the Soviet Union, you don't let it expand, one of two things will happen. It'll either explode like the students thought the flask would, or it will implode. It will turn in on itself. In either case, it'll stop being a threat to the United States. So his view of, and this was going to largely focus on Europe, where we thought the greatest danger was. The Truman Doctrine, which President Truman announced on March 12th, was the first statement of this containment policy in a policy form. It focused on the Greek Civil War. Uh, and because there were communists involved, local communists, although they may have received some aid from the Soviet Union, uh, they the sense was if we help those local communists, but with a larger purpose uh, of containing the Soviet Union, not allowing it to go to Greece, uh, that this would in fact be a way of stopping the Soviet Union from expanding. The Marshall Plan, which was a Secretary of State George Marshall announced actually just three months later, uh, although it didn't go into effect until 1948, took that even further and said, we have to help Europe rebuild, get themselves on their feet. There, you don't, if you have jobs for people and you don't have dissatisfied workers, you won't, communists won't be able to get a, a foothold through the fifth columnists in, uh, in Europe. And so we spent an extraordinary amount of money uh, at the time. The, the the amount of money we spent then would be the equivalent of $131 billion today, but you can't even think about it in those terms because the budget of the federal government was one-tenth of what it is today. And so we're talking about a, a much greater percentage of the federal government budget was spent on the Marshall Plan. Now, it helped our own uh, industries too, because if you were going to buy anything, you had to buy it from an American company. So it helped to stimulate our own economy. The last thing we did is we created NATO in 1949. I'll finish with this. Um, so we began to surround the Soviet Union with military bases. Um, and the Soviet Union saw this not as a defensive move, but as an offensive move by the United States. Uh, so we have some questions here. Uh, wasn't the Marshall Plan also that we could not have a repeat of what happened in Germany after World War II? Yes, the, precisely. The idea was that the, the depression in Germany had led to, to fascism, the rise of a demagogue. Uh, but uh, the idea wasn't so much about Germany this time. It was about worrying about the Soviet Union. But, you know, there is an element to this. This helped us have a role in Europe and NATO in the same way. There were three ideas about NATO uh, that we were trying to achieve simultaneously. The first was to keep the Soviets out. The second idea for NATO was to keep the United States in, to give the United States a role in, in Europe. And the third was to keep Germany down so it would not have a military because we continued to fear German militarism. Uh, so there were multiple reasons for it, but the Soviets focused on their being surrounded and believed the United States wanted to attack them. And there were people who did. So both countries acted in ways, Soviets acting in a defensive manner. That's why they were interested in taking over those countries. If we go back and, and look what they were trying to do, they were trying to prevent another invasion of their countries. You know, if, the, if they had wanted to... Uh, use this as a way of attacking Western Europe, they would have changed the rail lines in Poland. The rail lines in Poland were of a different uh, gauge than the rail lines in East Germany. Uh, and if they wanted to smoothly transport soldiers from the Soviet Union to Western Europe, they would have reconstructed the, the rail lines in Poland, but they didn't. They had those rail lines as different gauge so that Western Europe couldn't invade them. They were thinking defensively. In fact, if you go back to the fight between Trotsky and Stalin, Stalin was the one who did not want to have a global role for the Soviet Union. It was Trotsky who wanted to make global revolution in, in Lenin's mold. And if you recall, Stalin banished him and then assassinated him. 
Phil, so if I can, if I can ask a question here, <clears throat> you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the things that uh, scared the West was that was the triumph <clears throat> of uh, socialist in elections in Western Europe after World War II. Thinking particularly, <clears throat> excuse me, in Great Britain, where the British turned out the beloved war uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Why did the Soviets win? Oh, excuse me. Why did the socialists win those elections immediately after? World War II. What were some of the issues that propelled them into office? Well, for one thing, conservatives in France, uh, it was the Socialist Party that won. The conservatives in France, some of them had been Vichy and mm -hmm. supported the Nazis. Uh, the, the socialists were opposed by the Nazis, partly because the Nazis put them in prison. Um, and uh, and the, in Great Britain, there was so much suffering that the people couldn't remember the fact that Churchill defended them. They wanted a policy that would provide jobs. Uh, and they were suffering. They were really, there was, they had been bombed and there wasn't a plan by the Conservative Party to really renew uh, Britain after the war. So the socialists had a plan to help people and the conservatives mm -hmm. didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question here from Judith Batten. How realistic was the US analysis of the European situation after World War II. Was there a reasonable alternative? This puts me in mind of the analysis that Marshall gives in his Marshall Plan speech. And let me put a, in a plug for our lesson there. Take a look at that, it's a great lesson. But going back to Judith's question, how realistic was our analysis of the European situation after World War II, Phil? Well, the Soviets were in no position to take over Western Europe and they didn't want to. Uh, the, the Soviets actually, would have liked to be involved. What they were afraid of, though, they they didn't want to join the IMF and the institutions that the United States created because they saw the United States dominating them and they felt that they would be pawns of the United States. Now, again, this is partly an ideological framework they had, but they didn't trust the United States. So they were quite suspicious, especially Stalin, of doing anything that would put them under the thumb. They felt they had suffered during World War II with the United States taking advantage of them. Uh, and so they weren't about to be so uh, friendly after World War II. I think we had to extend ourselves as Roosevelt said he wanted to, not as Truman did. Right, and we have another, we have a good question here. Did we know that the Soviets uh, had no plans to uh, take over Western Europe? Uh, yes, we do know that. We, we knew that then. At least in the, they, I don't know if they knew it then. We know it now. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, but you know, this is the period of Stalin. Uh, they, when we begin to deal with the third world, the things change. And this doesn't happen until the 50s, actually. Uh, this graphic shows you how much the world did change. Uh, and so both countries, the Soviet Union, United States, saw the world now as a chessboard where we each, could claim countries uh, as a way of showing that we were stronger. Uh, let me rush on because we're almost near the end. Uh, I, well, so we, have, we have about 30 minutes. We've got some time. We don't have to rush. Finishing. I'm sorry. 8.30. Yeah, yeah. If we could go back to that slide, that, that past slide, the, the previous one of the map, we can take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> we see here the, uh, the decolonization moving from right after World War II up through the early 60s. And as we know, the Cold War was really, uh, uh, as you said, this is a great uh, check chessboard here where we're in competition with the Soviet Union for those, uh, for the allegiance of those colonies, those former colonies. Uh, this may sound like a dumb question, but why? Why did we want those colonies? Why was it important to us to have the good, uh, the allegiance of Chad, for example? Was it all about resources? So... No, of course not, but it was about resources. I mean, it begins in the Middle East where there is the concern about oil and the British are giving up and we see a vacuum and we want to replace the British for control of oil. But in Africa, it becomes a different issue. Uh, there was con some concern about uh, some strategic minerals uh, in some countries uh, that uh, uranium and things like that. But by and large, it came from this ideological fervor we had about Pax Americana. Uh, 
mm-hmm. and we, the belief that we now had a mission and that it, you know, it's somewhat like a, 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 a firm uh, uh, that believes that if they don't grow, that uh, some other company will come in and take over their territory. And so they have to grow, even though they want to stay small, they have to grow in order to be able to survive. Mm -hmm. Um, The logic of accumulation is that. And so both countries took on that same logic, that Mm -hmm. the the view was, as someone suggested, NAC 68, well, you have a very good lesson on NAC 68 by... Uh, by 1950, the Cold War was in place, and NSC 68 defined the world uh, as being zero sum. That was bipolar. There were only two parts: the East and the West. There was no room for a neutral in that scheme. Uh, it was zero sum. If uh, one side got uh, something, it was taking it from the other side. Think of a pie that's divided into two parts. The only way one uh, person can get some more is by taking it from the other person's portion. And so the uh, under that those circumstances, the, everything became uh, fair territory. We believe the Soviets wanted to expand everywhere. We had to contain everywhere. And that became an ideological statement also. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that mm-hmm. meant Chad became as important as Paris. Uh, wow. in the, uh, we have a good. We have, uh, Phil. We have a good question here. Merrill writes: Is there a domino? Was there a domino theory in places other than East Asia? So, um, the domino theory, which was articulated first by President Eisenhower, really comes from Munich. Uh, so, understand the, the logic of the Munich analogy. The Munich analogy comes from the decision in 1938, where uh, the uh, Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, goes to Munich to negotiate with Hitler. Hitler had taken over uh, already uh, parts. He had taken over Austria, and now he's taken over a part of Czechoslovakia called the Sudetenland, uh, where he claimed there were ethnic Germans living. And uh, the Chamberlain leaves that meeting with an agreement that he can keep the Sudetenland, or Germany can keep it, if uh, Hitler promises no more land grabs. He comes back and he says, we have peace in our time, and people call that appeasement. And the idea of appeasement is if you give a rapacious, a hungry dictator, uh, a uh, if you bow to his demand, uh, it won't satisfy the dictator's appetite. It will only make the dictator that more hungry. So it's like my dog, Alex. I mean, my, my wife gives my dog some hamburger. He comes over to the table and he smells the hamburger and he, he gets a little piece. It doesn't satisfy Alex. I hate to think of Alex as Hitler, but it doesn't satisfy Alex. It simply makes him want more hamburger. Um, and so don't give the dictator anything. You have to stand firm. That was the lesson of Munich, which is actually inaccurate history there, but still, that was the lesson that Eisenhower was using. So if we don't stop Vietnam, North Vietnam, which is a communist dictatorship, he believed, and like all communist dictatorships, serving the interest of the Soviet Union, wanting to expand, therefore, if you don't stop them uh, in Vietnam, they will try to take over another country and another country and they'll fall like dominoes, uh, the way in which the countries in Europe fell like dominoes. So the analogy goes back to Munich, and um, it wasn't really used in Africa as much because it was. It became clear that it was an analogy that didn't always work, didn't really make sense. Every each circumstance was uh, unique, uh, but it was something that people believed for a long time in the case of Southeast Asia. But very good question. Okay, so... Uh, shall we move ahead? What complicates the picture of the colonial... Uh, the end of colonialism is that China uh, saw itself in competition with the Soviet Union and didn't believe that the Soviets were 
revolutionary enough. Uh, that Mao called them state capitalists. And he said there were three worlds. There was the first world, the Western industrialized world. There was the second world, the Soviet Union and its puppets, the state capitalism. And then there was the third world, everyone else. And China was the natural leader of the third world. And so this set up a competition between China and the Soviet Union that the United States played off of uh, as a way of getting the Soviet Union to back down in some cases. Uh, President Nixon famously went to China partly for the sake of getting the Soviet Union to back down in its support for Vietnam. So uh, it, the second element of uh, uh, the, um, I'm sorry, fifth cause of the war. So the fifth cause of the war is domestic factors in both countries, but I'm going to focus on the United States because it's the part that's least uh, talked about. At the end of uh, World War II, though the United States economy was very strong, uh, there was a large wave of strikes in 1946. So if you think about who did the work during World War II, it was Rosie the Riveter. Uh, factories were uh, operating at uh, full capacity because women took the men's jobs. Now, I don't mean to uh, sound sexist about this, but it was true that at the time women were willing to take lower salaries than men. Um, and partly they were, uh, though Rosie the Riveter, the movie is about women striking, uh, most women didn't strike because it, they thought that it was unpatriotic. It, it was part of the war effort to do the work and suffer the small wages. When the men came back, women now left to start families. The men wanted to start families. And the, uh, and the idea was that they would need higher wages to pay for the, the families and the men wouldn't tolerate the low wages. A quarter of the US workforce was on strike at one point or another in 1946. And in Washington, we saw this those in power at the time, not me, they saw this as a, uh, a, a revolutionary situation. Um, and they had thought they had a way of dealing with the problems of the US economy through something called the Full Employment Act of 1946. Uh, Roosevelt had actually uh, commissioned the creation of this in 1944. Uh, and there was a plan to regulate the economy so that there would be higher wages and there wouldn't be gluts in the economy and things could flow smoothly. But Congress destroyed all those possibilities. The Full Employment Act became the Employment Act of 1946 and all the regulatory mechanisms were taken out. Basically, the only thing that remained was the Council of Economic Advisors. And so to deal with the problem, they felt they had no nothing left but to go to the solution that actually got us out of the depression in the 30s so if you look at the chart you see that when the first year of the new deal fiscal year 1933 the uh, the gross domestic product of the united states was 57 billion dollars and the federal government spent four and a half billion dollars it was eight percent of the gross domestic product government spending. So the New Deal happens, all of those wonderful alphabet projects, a lot of money was stimulating the economy. The GDP goes up, the spending doubles to $9.1 billion. It becomes over 10% of the GDP, but we actually don't get out of the depression. Uh, in fact, there's a mini depression in 1938. What gets us out of the depression, if you look six years later is the war. The spending on the war is so much that the federal government budget goes up by 10 times and it becomes almost 42% of the, of the entire gross domestic product of the United States. That's what gets us out of depression. That's what gets money flowing through the economy. That, and then in the, the military got decommissioned and the federal government budget goes down to $36 billion from $92 billion 
for the next year. And so the fear was without this stimulus, this stimulus from the federal government that had been based on war spending, they were in a big pickle. How do you justify military spending, though, to a population that was war weary and uh, and also didn't want to spend money on on the war? It wanted to get money for itself. So there's a question the New Deal legislation was a failure. No, it wasn't a failure. It just didn't succeed in getting us out of the Depression. It brought a lot of good things. Uh, it, it provided for wonderful arts. It provided for public works. It provided for unionization that gave workers some power. Uh, but it also led to those strikes in 1946 that scared people in Washington. Uh, so how do you convince people that we need, in fact, to spend more money on the military. And that leads us to 1947, uh, when they begin a very concerted anti-communist crusade. It begins with the loyalty security program uh, that President Truman puts in place. The loyalty security program required every federal government uh, in... Uh, Marianne is asking, is not that the definition of failure? Well, you can discuss that. I, if you want to say that the, the New Deal was a failure, you could argue that, but I, you'd have to take into account what its successes were. I, I, I don't know if we want to argue that now, uh, but it would be an interesting question to raise. Let's go back to 1947. The Loyalty Security Program says that uh, the, everyone had, who worked for the federal government had to sign a card pledging that they were not members of the Communist Party. Now I ask you, if you were a member of the Communist Party, suppose you were a spy, would you sign the card? You of course sign the card pledging that you weren't because the it was much more dangerous not to sign the card. And so that kind of program didn't in fact root out any communists. What it did is it scared people. It said that the communists were under every rock. They were, you never knew who was a communist because they could look like anyone else. Uh, and so uh, it became a kind of way of scaring people into believing that communists were everywhere. And then state governments and city governments followed suit. So any public employee had to sign these kinds of things. They became rampant throughout the United States. In 1947 also, we began, we uh, passed the Taft-Hartley Act. Now, part of the Taft-Hartley Act was that uh, it would uh, have, uh, uh, it would provide for uh, a uh, control over unions by having a an 80-day cooling off period. Unions uh, uh, could no longer, states could pass laws that prevented closed shops, but it also was sp stipulated that no member of the Communist Party could be an officer of a union. Again, going after uh, people for their their political party organization, their, uh, membership. This was the time that the Hollywood blacklist started. So some of you may have seen the film Trumbo with Brian Cranston. Uh, and that's a pretty good film about this period. In fact, it's one of the only films Hollywood's ever made that talks about the blacklist. The blacklist was a list of uh, people who were alleged to be members of the Communist Party and weren't allowed to be screenwriters or actors or directors in Hollywood. Uh, a lot of them lost their uh, jobs. What Trumbo did is he, as others did, he continued to write some terrific scripts because he was a great, good, this is Dalton Trumbo, terrific uh, screenwriter, uh, but some other person would put their name uh, on the script. And uh, as a result, uh, it, the, the, uh, the public didn't know that Trumbo was the actual author. But Hollywood loved this because they knew what was going on. They were able to get these scripts at a much lower price. Trumbo liked it because he was able to get some money and survive. So it was a, a matter of convenience, but it was a very ugly business that meant that people who were alleged communists even uh, couldn't uh, participate and work in Hollywood. Uh, 
So Marianne is asking. Well, she <clears throat> uh, she notes here she she had to leave. <clears throat> she notes here uh, uh, she disagrees with uh, um, some of the things you said. That your argument seems to be that there was no real idea behind our fighting communism, other than fear and misunderstanding of the USSR's motives. She respectfully disagrees with that interpretation, and then she had to go. Um, that I, I'm not entirely sure. That's that's um, your position this evening. Uh, would you like to comment on that, Phil? Well, it's not what I'm trying to offer are a range of possible explanations that mm -hmm. I want the group to discuss and think about. But let, let's continue with the, the anti-communist crusade that is, occurs in this period. There's a, there were TV shows that were common. One of them was I Led Three Lives. Let's see if we can watch a short beginning of that uh, right here. true story of Herbert A. Philbrick, who for nine frightening years did lead three lives. Average citizen, high-level member of the Communist Party, and counter-spy for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. For obvious reasons, the names, dates, and places have been changed, but the story is based on fact. The Communist Party does not believe in Christmas, except as it can turn it to its own advantage. This is the story of an attempt by the communists to cash in on the spirit of the Christmas season. Let's come back here. So there we go. Oh. Oh. <laughs> there we go. So the original war on Christmas, eh? The original war on Christmas. I'm trying to give you a sense of how pervasive this was. Um, that. This was the period when there were congressional hearings by the House Un-American Activities Committee. Now, what does it mean to be an un-American? Uh, I would say having such hearings to be un-American because we want freedom of speech, but they went after people who they believed were uh, not living up to, as you suggested, Richard, the, uh, the credo of whatever uh, we were, the government was uh, declaring. This is the period when Lillian Hellman a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, playwright, uh, very famous at the time, uh, uh, went before the committee uh, and was asked to name the names of people she knew who was communist. And she said, I testify on my behalf, but I'm not gonna name, name names as other people have done. She said, I won't cut my uh, principles to suit the latest fashions. Uh, a famous line that she had used to denounced the committee and they actually let her get away with it because she was so prominent uh, and intellectual. But the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee also existed at the time to do the same kinds of things. And probably their most famous member was McCarthy. Now, this period is often called McCarthyism because it enables us to focus on one man and to suggest that this was a period that was an aberration. It was due to his craziness. The reality was that McCarthy didn't come into office uh, until this period had started, and he didn't begin his craziness until 1950. And he used as a basis the loyalty security program, saying that Truman hadn't been vigilant enough in rooting out communists in the State Department. And he had a list of, well, it varied between 150 and 180, and then it was 350. And he it was a, a, a sense of exaggeration uh, that scared a lot of people until someone stood up to him. The, essentially, the army stood up to him when he claimed that the army was now infiltrated by communists, um, and he was censured by the Senate in 1955. I, my daily life was affected. I grew up during the Cold War. I had to wear a dog, metal dog tag to school every day. Uh, because I was told that if when the Soviets exploded an atomic bomb, I would be incinerated, but at least they would be able to identify who I was by the metal dog tag. We had once a month duck and cover exercises where we protected ourselves by ducking under a wooden desk at school. And there were political campaigns that used anti-communist spears. There's a poster 
from the campaign in Florida, where uh, uh, the uh, in the Democratic primary, Claude Pepper had been a New Deal senator elected uh, in on a to support Franklin Roosevelt in 1936, um, and uh, he. Uh, was, well, I'm sorry, 1938, and he was now running against George Smathers, a uh, congressman who had been uh, John Kennedy's roommate at Harvard. Um, and the, the uh, Smathers would go into the uh, backwoods parts of Florida and denounce uh, Claude Pepper for having been a, a person who was multilingual which scared people, or that he was uh, had a sister who was a thespian, an, ac an actress. Of course, that scared people as well. I mean, these kinds of allegations were rampant all over the country. Um, and uh, it was part of a, a, a reinforcement that said, we are under major threat from this foreign enemy. And that could justify a military buildup, which begins to occur in 1947, with the National Security Act of 1947. Phil, if I, Phil, if I could just, inter if I could just um, bring some questions in here. You said that <clears throat> the, uh, the Cold War affected your life uh, directly. Uh, it affected Merrill's, too. Um, he writes here, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, so I remember this year well. In fifth grade, I wrote Khrushchev a letter and sent it, and my neighbors warned my parents that they might be targeted as communists because of this. Um, and then we have another participant saying that uh, she watched the Duck and Cover movies every month. Now, Rashida Smith wants to know about comic books. How did comic books play a role? She's planning a unit on the Cold War, and she'd like to use comic books. I know people were worried about them in the 50s. Was it a Cold War worry or a juvenile delinquency worry? Well, I mean, the um, it was a worry because some of the writers of comic books, Superman comic book, for example, the person who wrote it was a, a leftist. Um, and so there was an element in the comic books of uh, a, a kind of ideology of um, vigilantism uh, in some sense. Uh, after all, Batman and Superman, they broke laws. Uh, they didn't let the police do their job. It was a vigilante quality to them. Uh, there was, a, in some ways, comic books were a subversive art. Uh, in this period, um, and the I, I think it would be very interesting to take a look at efforts by some to counter that. You know, Dick Tracy, for example, would be a good one to take a look at because they didn't he didn't only go after criminals; he went after s subversives. Uh, and so it would be very interesting to take a look at. I, I don't think there was much in Archie comic books. <laughs> in the in the the, the ones. Like with the superheroes, there was an element of that. Certainly was. Right. Phil, let me let me ask you a question. You talked about a military buildup in terms of the impact on the American economy, but didn't we really have some things to fear? I mean, after all, the Soviet Union did have an awful lot of missiles aimed at us. They tried to put missiles in Cuba. We had tanks facing each other in Berlin. Was there not? And Khrushchev comes here to the UN and he thumps his shoe on the table and says he's going to bury us. Weren't there real reasons to fear the Soviet Union during the Cold War? Well, you know, that takes us into the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So once something begins, it does take on a life of its own. Uh, and both sides ratchet it up, even beyond what they might have imagined. Um, so remember, Khrushchev goes to the UN in 1960 when he does that. Mm -hmm. He claims, he said he'll bury us. What he meant was so uh, Soviet communism will outlast American capitalism so that They'll be the people who bury us. Uh, but he didn't mean we're going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he tried to have uh, an effort to work with the United States. The Cuban Missile Crisis, as I have written, uh, is a case where it was based on a lot of misunderstanding and, the, and, it, and fears on the part of the Soviet Union. It wasn't just about their being antagonistic, but it did bring us to there was great fear and they did have missiles but we actually had many more missiles than they did uh until the cuban missile crisis they put missiles in there because they were they didn't have sufficient amount uh and the the result was we 
felt we had to build up more. They had to build up more. And that's when the arms race really took off after the missile crisis. Uh, so unintended consequences of these fears actually hurt both sides. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways to think about this is to begin to think about, well, let's, I, we can talk about some of these questions, but I, I think it's important to go to take a look at the lessons we have from this. Um, so one of the lessons is that if you begin to try to look at more than one factor, uh, yes, they built up, we built up. Why did both sides feel they had to build up? Well, partly it was because of misunderstanding about the adversary's motives. Uh, we were partly building up for domestic reasons as much as trying to antagonize the Soviet Union. Uh, they were building up for uh, domestic reasons as well um, uh, to satisfy a military that felt it was uh, in ragtag shape. Uh, but if you can begin to put yourself in the other, in your adversary's shoes and look at yourself from their perspective, you begin to soften your antagonism and you begin to see that maybe the other side is not fully antagonistic, that they are acting defensively. And then you can act in ways that reduce their fears rather than exacerbate their fears. That's a way of bringing about a more peaceful world rather than thinking that everything has to be escalated in terms of military. So one of the lessons here is that there are many different sources of the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, even if we don't even call it a conflict competition, tension, and it could have been different, I believe, if we in fact used an approach that says really that we can understand, try to understand the culture of another side, the ideology of another side, personalities are important. Uh, you know, you want them, you, we want countries to believe it in 2016 that the United States, even though we have some candidates saying we're gonna nuke other countries, that not, the United States is not prepared to nuke every other country in the world because that's gonna make people very frightened. And this idea of winning the Cold War is a very dangerous idea because Wars get won, but one of the reasons I want people to really rethink the definition of the Cold War, not as a war, but as a period of tension, is that winning means there was a loser. Um, and uh, countries don't like to lose. And so if our, our narrative is that we won and you lost, it doesn't help us now deal with the future. After all, the, the Russians still have a lot of nuclear weapons. And I want people to see that even a, a simple thing like a chronology can change your perspective because other, the other side thinks differently than we may in terms of when these conflicts start. Well, Merrill, <clears throat> Merrill writes, the Cold War seems more and more to me like a tit for tat, seemed the same way with the NSC and the Cold War in East Asia. I think that that reflects your point, Phil, that once it got going, uh, it did become a kind of tit for tat thing, but didn't start out that way necessarily. But by you know by the '60s, let's say, it became a action reaction. Would that be yes, fair to say? Mirror each other, the two countries mirrored each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our webinar this evening. Are there any final questions and comments before we wrap things up? And Phil, while that's coming in, let me thank you very much for a a really engaging and provocative uh, webinar tonight. I've learned some things. I don't think I'll look at the Cold War the same way after your discussion of chronology and definition. And I lived through the Cold War, so thank you very much. Well, thank you. Very good questions. Yes, indeed. And I want to thank our participants for their good questions and their active and intelligent participation this evening. Uh, please remember our next webinar. We're going to change gears quite a bit. We're going to be looking at the a uh, wonderful realist painter, Edward Hopper. We're going to be looking at that 7 p.m. Thursday, April 7th. Please don't forget to uh, turn in your evaluations. <clears throat> and after you do that, you can download your uh, certificate of participation so you can get your CEUs. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please join us next week. And for this evening, good night. <laughs>